morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Am I going through? Okay. A um, little louder? Okay. Do you hear that in the back? How about now? Oh, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, going to start off with a shameless plug. If any of you remember the Doc and Jim show, radio show, um, we're coming back online. So starting this Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon, if you go to docandjimshow.com, that will get you to the, uh, the link, I guess, where you can listen in. I guess they can watch us too. So uh, if you missed the Doc and Jim show, we're back. So. This evening is, is going to be a real departure for me. When I talk about the Battle of Pearl Harbor or um, the North African campaign, Guadalcanal, I'm talking to you about things that I've studied and I've read about. When I talk to you tonight about the Eagle Squadrons of the Fourth Fighter Group, I have been involved with them since 2005. And in 2005, a lot of our World War II veterans were still with us. So if I talk about Don Allen or Frank Spear or Andy Lacey or Steve Pisanos, these aren't people that I just read about in books. These were my friends and they're gone. There's only a handful left. So tonight is a bit of a departure. When you drive on to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, if you go through the main gate on Berkeley, there's a sign that says, Home of the RAF Eagle Squadrons. A lot of people probably don't know what that means. And then when you continue on the base, you see a Spitfire on display. You know, why would an Air Force Base have a Spitfire on display? Well, that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight, is the Eagle Squadrons and the Fourth Fighter Group. Beginning of World War II, we have to start off with what is the most powerful air force in the world? Well, how do you measure that? Well, one of the ways that you measure how great an air force is is by its aces. An ace is someone who shoots down five aircraft. The highest scoring American ace of all time is this gentleman, Dick Bong flew the P-38 Lightning in the Pacific, and he shot down 40 Japanese planes. Wow, 40. That means he was an ace eight times over. Then there was this fellow, Major Eric Bubby. Bubby means the kid, Hartman. Here he is with his dog. Loved his dog. He was not only a very good dog owner, he was a very good pilot. Here he is flying his ME-109 with his distinctive tulips on the front of the aircraft. How many planes did he shoot down? 352. One guy. German Luftwaffe means air weapon. Well, Hartmann wasn't the only one. Germans had two aces that each shot down more than 300 planes, Hartman and Barkhorn. 15 aces who each shot down more than 200 planes. 106 aces who each shot down more than 100 planes. I actually counted this because I, I was curious. There were 372 German aces who each shot down more than 40 planes. So if Dick Bong was a German ace, he would have been their 373rd highest scoring ace. Luftwaffe was the most powerful air force in the world at the beginning of World War II. They had great planes. It's the ME-109. They're one of the most highly mass-produced planes in history. That's what uh, Hartman flew. FW-190, even better than the ME-109. ME-262, the world's first operational jet planes. 
So when we're fighting the Germans and we're flying P-47s and Mustangs and Lightnings, they've all got props. Germans have jets. Battle of Britain. That's where we're going to start. Now, up until now, Hitler's been pretty successful conquering Europe. But there's this pesky little thing called the English Channel between France and England. And they've got to overcome that. So he sends the Luftwaffe to take out the Royal Air Force so that Germany can invade England. What happens if England loses the Battle of Britain? Well, Germany's already aligned with Russia, so they would have effectively conquered Europe. If and when the U.S. gets into the war, how do we get to war with Germany if we can't use England as the staging point for our armies and our Air Force? No naval war against Germany. No RAF continuing the war against Germany. No U.S. air, air war against Germany. Plus, England is effectively out of the war against Japan. That's how important this battle is. Now, I want to introduce you to three of my favorite people in the whole world. This is Shorty Keo. How short was he? Four foot ten. Couldn't fly for the U.S. Army Air Corps, the Navy. It was too short. Didn't meet the minimum height requirements. Red Tobin, he was taller than me. He was like six foot five, tall, slim. Everybody, he kind of reminded people of an American cowboy. Andy Mamadoff, the mad Russian, first generation American, parents were from Russia. All three of them were involved in aviation when World War II broke out. Um, Shorty did barnstorming. His favorite thing was to jump out of airplanes. He did that about 500 times. Red actually flew for a small airline, and Andy flew in uh, shows across the country. These three guys wanted to get into the war. This is before the Eagle Squadrons. First, they went to France to join the French. They got there just in time to have the Germans roll over France. So they barely got back to England, and England said, you guys can fly? Sure. So these three flew in the Battle of Britain. Seven Americans in total flew for the Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain. This is three out of seven. Why does Germany lose the Battle of Britain? And they did indeed lose. Luftwaffe is built to win tactical war. In other words, it's almost as if the planes are flying artillery. British radar gave the RAF the ability to concentrate their fighters so they knew when the Germans were coming, how many, and they could go up and meet them. Germany was actually winning the Battle of Britain when they were focused on bombing airfields and destroying the RAF. A British plane bombed Berlin, and Hitler was like, well, we can't allow that, so they started bombing London. Huge mistake. The Germans had continued to take out the RAF, they would have been successful. But Germany was not prepared to fight a strategic war. We'll talk about more, more later, but they didn't have good long-range heavy bombers, and even their fighters, when they appeared over England, which is just across the channel, they had very few minutes of fuel and very few minutes of fight before they had to return home. England is desperately short of pilots. So what are they going to do? Let's form the Eagle Squadrons and recruit American pilots, American volunteers, because we're not in the war yet. We're not even close to Pearl Harbor. So this is the concept of the Eagle Squadrons. Now, how do you become an Eagle Squadron pilot? Well, you go to Canada. And there's a committee up there, the Knight Committee. You interview with them, and if they like you, they'll take you on. So Steve Pisanos, Steve grows up poor in Greece, class structure, no way he's going to be a fighter pilot. He gets a job working on a tanker. Tanker docks in Baltimore, jump ship, 
goes to New York, works in a Greek restaurant and saves every dime to take flying lessons. So he hears the Royal Air Force is looking for fighter pilots, I'm in. So he goes to Canada and joins up. Kid Hofer, you can talk a lot about him. One of my favorite people in the history of the fourth fighter group. He goes to Canada to visit a friend. Hofer is a boxer, football player, likes to mix it up. Canadian border guard sees this strapping young American and he goes, ah, Yank, you're here to join the Eagle Squadrons. And Hofer looks at him and goes, what's that? He goes, ah, join the Royal Air Force. Fly, Spitfire, shoot down Germans. And Hofer goes, where do I go? That's how he joins. Now I'm gonna skip ahead, because you can't talk about Kid Hofer without talking about his dog. Oops, sorry. His dog, Duke. I'm a dog guy, so gotta talk about dogs. Now, why do we have to talk about Duke? Here's one photo, this is uh, next to their airplane. That's Kid, of course. Kid in his favorite football jersey with Duke. Beautiful dog. Here they are again. These are his victories. You put little crosses on the side of your, fus your fuselage to do that. Kid would take Duke up in the plane with him when they're flying training missions over England. He'd find another American plane, and he'd fly right alongside of it only he would duck down in the cockpit. <laughs> so the other pilot would look over and see the dog flying the plane. And it was like, damn. The Germans have taught their dogs how to fly. And how did that dog get a Mustang? That was Kid. Kid marched to his own drummer. I, I couldn't help. His biography is called Kid Hofer, The Last of the Screwball Aces. He, uh, he marched to his own drummer. We would escort bombers to Berlin, and that wasn't enough excitement for him. He'd strafe a German airfield on the way home. I mean, I know that firsthand because I had a very good friend called Frank Speer that had the misfortune to be Kid's wingman. So when Kid said, hey, let's go strafe a German airfield, Frank had no choice but to go with him. So they strafed the field, and Frank used to always say, well, the Germans would try to hit the lead plane, but they always got the wingman, in this case, me. So he spent 11 months as a uh, guest of the Germans. September 1940, the first Eagle Squadron, 71 Eagle Squadron, is stood up at RAF Church Fenton. This gentleman here, Bill Dunn, Another one of those, if he hadn't lived it, you wouldn't have believed it. He wanted to be a pilot. So in the 30s, he joined the Canadian Army because someone said, if you join the Canadian Army, they'll make you a pilot. They never did. So as we're getting closer to the war, someone said, well, I'll, I take it back. He joined the American Army first, and he never became a pilot. And somebody said, oh, but if he joined the Canadian Army, they'll, let, they'll make you a pilot because he had flying experience, joined the Canadian Army, didn't become a pilot, was sent to England as an anti-aircraft gunner, wound up shooting down German planes that way, but they found out he could fly, so he became an Eagle Squadron pilot. Along the way, he was a cowboy, rodeo, bronco buster, I mean, this guy did it all. He shot down his fifth German plane on 27 August 1941. So among the many firsts that the fourth fighter wing can lay claim to is the first American ace of World War II, Bill Dunn. We had so many volunteers, we had to have a second squadron. So May 1941, 121 Eagle Squadron is stood up at RAF Curtin in Lindsay. I had the privilege of going there in 2012 where they unveiled this beautiful black granite monument to the Americans who died flying for the Eagle Squadrons while, while flying for the Royal Air Force. Just magnificent. Final Eagle Squadron, 1 August 1941, 
133 Eagle Squadron stood up at RAF Cultus Hall. The squadrons were never based together. They were with other RAF wings, but they were the real deal. 71 Squadron actually led all RAF squadrons in number of kills for several months. They did fly together one time, 19 August 1942, Operation Jubilee. That was the raid on Dieppe to practice assaulting a uh, fortified coast, kind of getting ready for D-Day. Didn't go too well for the raid itself, but our guys, did, uh, our guys did pretty good. Now, you remember Andy, Shorty, and Red? Well, 15 February 1941, coming back from a mission, Shorty's Spitfire just starts descending towards the water. The guys are screaming, Shorty, Shorty, and someone actually flew close and looked in the cockpit. He slumped over the controls, slammed into the water, killed. They figured his oxygen had failed. He died. They never found him, but they found size five boots. The only RAF pilot flying that was wearing size five boots was Shorty. 7 September 1941, Red Tobin's flight is attacked by about 100 German fighters. Tobin shot down and killed. 30 August 1941, Andy Mamadoff marries an English gal, Alice Penny Laird Craven in Epping. His squadron buzzes the town to celebrate his wedding. Shortly thereafter, he transfers to 133 Squadron as a section leader. 8 October, they're doing maneuvers up in Northern Ireland, tends to be a bit foggy up there, and his flight of four planes crashes into the side of a mountain, and he's killed. The founding fathers of the 4th Fighter Wing make it till about two months before Pearl Harbor, and they're gone. These are just some shots of our Eagle Squadron pilots in action. Here they are waiting, waiting to be called for a mission, explaining this is how I shot down the Hun. Gotta love it. Everybody's got a dog. Racing for the Morlay mission. Morlay mission, this is only a few days before the Eagle Squadrons become the 4th Fighter Group. 133 Squadron consists of 12 Spitfires at that time, and they go on what should be a fairly routine mission, but freakish weather, 100 mile an hour winds, blows them completely away from where they're supposed to be. They wind up coming down. They actually think they're over England. They're still over France and they're destroyed by a combination of German anti-aircraft fire and German fighters. 100% casualties. The entire squadron is, uh, is destroyed. 245 Americans served as Eagle Squadron pilots, and they endured a 45% casualty rate in their short 18 months of service. That's almost half. So if you volunteered to be an Eagle Squadron pilot, Chances were one out of two, you weren't going to make it. 29 September 1942, big ceremony. This is when the Eagle Squadrons become the 4th Fighter Group. They found other guys in the other squadrons to put in place of the 133 guys, because most of them were gone. This is the actual words, I'm going to read them to you because I think they're cool. Air Chief Marshal Douglas, Royal Air Force. This is the speech he gives at the ceremony when the Eagle Squadrons become the fourth fighter group. We at Fighter Command deeply regret this parting from the course of the past 18 months. We have seen the stuff of which you are made and we could not ask for better companions with whom to see the fight through to the finish. It is with deep personal regret that I today say goodbye to you whom it has been my privilege to command. You joined us readily and of your own free will when our need was greatest. There are those of your number who are not here today, those sons of the United States who were first to give their lives for their country. 
we of the Royal Air Force, no less than yourselves, will always remember them with pride. The U.S. Army Air Corps, their gain is very much the Royal Air Force's loss. The loss to the Luftwaffe will no doubt continue as before. You are the vanguard of that great host of your compatriots who are now helping us to make these islands a base for which to mount that great offensive which we all desire. Goodbye, and thank you, Eagle Squadrons number 71, 121, and 133. And good hunting to you. Gotta love the British. 71 becomes the 334th Fighter Squadron. 121 becomes the 335th Fighter Squadron. 133 becomes the 336th Fighter Squadron. Initially, when I found this out, I, I thought this was the coolest thing in the whole world. The maintainers, the maintenance folks, when we were the Eagle Squadrons, were British women. The Royal Air Force Women's Auxiliary Corps. We became the fourth fighter group in September. Our maintainers didn't show up till December. So women are maintaining our planes. And when our maintainers showed up in December, they taught our guys how to maintain our planes. I just think that's the coolest thing in the world. After the Spitfire, which is this beautiful, sleek, nimble, maneuverable aircraft, one of the most beautiful aircraft ever created, they switched us to the Jug, the P-47 Thunderbolt. Magnificent plane, but it's the biggest one-engine, piston-driven airplane of World War II. So it's like going from a Maserati to an 18-wheeler. It was tough. It was really hard on our guys to go from the Spitfire to the P-47. 16 August 1943, just had to share this with you. Colonel Edward Anderson, who's the current 4th Fighter Group commander, this morning the pilots of the 4th Fighter Group destroyed 17 enemy aircraft, probably destroyed two more, damaged four. Much of the credit for this impressive score belongs to the ground crews of this station, and this is as it should be. Too often the efforts of the men who put the planes in the air are overlooked, but the pilots know, and I know, the value of their work. To accomplish the results we achieved today means that ground crews were right in their pitching. That's good leadership. Another picture of the, uh, the P-47. This is Donnie Boy. This is Don Gentile. Going to talk a little bit more about him. General Eisenhower called Gentile a one-man Air Force. He was the first American to shoot down more planes than Eddie Rickenbacker. He was our ace of aces in World War I. So he was a very significant guy. Don Blakesley. He's my guy. As far as I'm concerned, he's the father of the 4th Fighter Wing. He's the George Washington of the 4th Fighter Wing. He's the man. Eagle Squadron pilot, after 133 Eagle Squadron, he's, he wasn't in 133, he was in 121. After they're destroyed, he gathers up the replacement pilots, the new guys, and takes them out on a mission that, on the one hand, scares the bejesus out of them, but on the other hand, gives them the confidence and the courage to accept the challenge of being the new pilots of 133 Squadron. Unbelievable leader. Even before he becomes the 4th Fighter Group commander, he's taking other groups into battle who are flying the P-51 Mustang. So on their initial combat missions, he's leading them. His attitude, we're here to kill Germans. I've seen a lot of gun camera footage I can always tell which is Blakesley's because he always gets up close and personal behind the enemy aircraft and blows them out of the sky. If the airplane is disintegrating into nothing, 
Blakesley's doing it. That was Blakesley. Shortly after Blakesley is given command of the 4th Fighter Group, January 1944, he goes to General Kepner. Kepner is in charge of uh, fighters for the 8th Air Force. Now, when Blakesley was flying Mustangs to lead other groups into battle, at the end of the day, he'd bring his Mustang back to Debden, when our guys are still flying the P-47. He'd land the Mustang, taxi it in, and he'd be surrounded by pilots and maintainers. And they would look at the plane and they'd go, this is the ship. And Blakesley would get out of the Mustang and go, this is the ship. So he goes to Kepner and he said, you got to switch us to Mustangs. Our guys are used to Spitfires. We're doing okay, the P-47, but we need to be in uh, Mustangs. Kepner looks at Blakesley and says, Colonel, I can't take the fourth fighter group, my best group, out of the line for months while you transition to the Mustang. Blakesley looks at him, he goes, General, 24 hours. You give me 24 hours and we'll be flying Mustangs. Fourth fighter group comes back from a mission in their P-47s and lined up along the runway is all those brand spanking new Mustangs. 24 hours later, Blakesley is leading them in a combat mission over Europe. Kept his word to General Kepner. First month, the first full month that we're flying Mustangs, we shoot down 229 German planes. It's what the Mustangs of the 4th Fighter Group look like. Red noses. 7 January 1944, Blakesley's been the boss for a week. The 4th Fighter Group's assigned to support straggling bombers. Well, the Luftwaffe loves to shoot them down. So a dozen FW-190s attack the bombers. Well, Blakesley, even though he's in charge, he goes right in the middle of it, attacks the fighter, shoots one down. He's attacked by three. His plane is seriously damaged. Looks like we're going to have to say goodbye to Don Blakesley. Well, the cool thing about the 4th Fighter Group, you're surrounded by excellence. Captain James Goodson, one of our highest scoring aces, in fact, he's tied as the highest scoring ace of our, of our group, shoots down two of them. Vermont Garrison jumps in. What are his credentials? There's seven Americans who are aces in World War II and aces in the Korean War, Vermont Garrison's one of them. You couldn't want two better pilots to help you out. They saved Blakesley. They escort him back to make sure he's okay. These are our guys. This Hollywood handsome guy sitting right there, Steve Pisanos. We're gonna, we learned a little bit. We're going to learn a little bit more about him. 4 March 1944. We escort B-17 bombers to Berlin. First fighters to escort them. Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, the head of the Luftwaffe, is in Berlin. Here's the bombers overhead, walks out of a building, is with a buddy, looks up, sees our fighters, says to his buddy, war's over, we've lost. Just the fact that we had the capability to escort bombers to Berlin with our fighters, he knew Germans could not compete with that. We tangle with ME-109s and 190s, but the mission is a success. This is one of the more significant accomplishments of the 4th but 1st. This is Reich Marshal Hermann Goering. He liked his medals and his ribbons and, and all that stuff. 13 April 1944, Don Gentili, I talked about him. Blakesley had a rule. If you prang your kite, you're going home. Your kite is your airplane. To prang it meant you crashed it. Not enemy action. You messed up. You were responsible for crashing your own plane. So Gentili, he's a hero. Like I said, Eisenhower calls him a one-man air force. 
There's a big event. The press is waiting at Debden for our guys to come back. Gentilly knows that. He knows the press are waiting for him. So he buzzes the field, flies as low to the ground as he can, misjudges it, crashes his plane, destroys it. Blakesley's away from the crash, but he can hear it. He's with somebody else, and uh, the other pilot says, I wonder who just crashed their plane. Blakesley said, doesn't matter. Whoever it is, they're going home. So he sent the best pilot in the fourth fighter group home, and he never came back, because that was Blakesley's rule. This is Jen Tilly in his Mustang, Shangri-La. And these are his victories. He shot down more than a couple. 5 March 1944, Steve Pisanos crash lands in France. I told you about him, Greek immigrant. And 334th Fighter Squadron, he shoots down 10, 10 aircraft to become a double ace. His plane is hit on 5 March 44. He literally gets out of the plane while it's still in flight, but his dinghy strap catches in the cockpit. So he's trapped on the wing as he's going in for a crash. He can't bail out. Well, he survives. It takes him six months to get back to England, so what does he do? He fights with the French resistance for six months. When he comes back to Debden, he can't fly anymore because he knows all about the French resistance. Can't send him back. If he's captured by the Germans, they'll torture him, and they'll find out about the French resistance. That's what it looks like when you're trying to get out of your airplane and you can't. Hanging on for dear life. Becomes the air attache to Greece. This poor immigrant kid lived one of the great lives of all time. This is his autobiography, if you ever want to read something amazing. Um, 2011, I had a bunch of school kids come here from Curtin and Lindsay to do a research project on the Eagle Squadrons because they were based at Curtin and Lindsay. Well, I had spoken to Steve previously so I called him up and I said, can the kids interview you over the phone? Absolutely, that'd be great. Could not have been more charming, more helpful. Just a, a true American hero. D-Day. This is James Goodson, tied with Kid Hofer as our top scoring ace of World War II. Eisenhower asked Major Goodson if the 4th Fighter Group could keep the German reinforcements from moving up to the beaches. And Goodson says, in daylight, absolutely. June 5th, 1944, I tell this story when I, when I brief our airmen. And to me, this story epitomizes what the Eagle Squadrons, the 4th Fighter Group, and today's 4th Fighter Wing are all about. If you get this story, you get this wing. June 5th, 1944, Don Blakesley calls the entire group together for a briefing. This is the ultimate been there, done that group of people. Eagle Squadron veterans, aces, we had 81 aces in World War II. Calls them all together. So gentlemen, tomorrow's D-Day, the invasion of Europe. Germans know we're coming. They don't know exactly where, they don't know exactly when, but they know we're coming. You know what's harder than invading a fortified beachhead in war? Nothing. That's why the Marines do it. But the Marines are in the Pacific, so the Army's got to do it. The Army Air Corps has got to help. Blakesley thinks the Germans have been holding back They've got a thousand of their best planes and their best pilots just waiting for us. Their jet planes, their rocket planes. He thinks it's going to be a real bloodbath. So he's got everybody together and he says, gentlemen, we're close enough to the beaches. We're going to fly as many missions as we can. We'll do multiple missions. One of the guys there, Captain McGratton, raises his hand. Captain McGratton has his orders home. He's done. 
He says, Colonel, you got a plane for me? Blakesley looks at his maintainers and they, yeah, we got a plane. McGratton says, I'm going. Okay. So Blakesley's talking about all this and how bad it's going to be. And he pauses, he looks around the room. He says, gentlemen, if at the end of the day tomorrow, we have successfully landed our armies in France, and not one of us makes it back alive, that's okay. And the entire room was, yes, sir, all in, 100%. Next day, 0330, first mission. Noon, 1220, second mission. 820, 6 p.m., third mission. Three missions in one day. Kid Hofer leads a flight of four planes, including Captain McGratton. Only Hofer comes home alone. He's the only one that, that makes it out of the four planes. McGratton is killed. We lose 10 planes, seven pilots killed, two POWs, one manages to get away. Last one in, Don Blakesley, of course, pulls into his landing spot, landing gear collapses. 0130 on 7 June, they finally get to go to bed. The D-Day landings are successful. Of course, we know who that is. That's Eisenhower. This is an older photo. I, I cheated a little bit. This is Don Blakesley. That's Gentilly. Gentilly wasn't around anymore because he pranged his kite. That's who this wing is. Doesn't matter if it's the Germans, Koreans, Chinese, Russians, Vietnamese. Doesn't matter the weapon system. Whatever the challenge is, Throughout its history, this wing has met the challenge. Shortly after D-Day, the wing flies the Russian shuttle mission. This is Don Blakesley. Oops, sorry. Took him 16 maps to find his way from England to Russia. And he's saying to the Russians, see, I'm, I got here within five minutes of when I said I would. That's Blakesley. What was the Russian shuttle mission? Well, 48 of our pilots escort B-17s to targets in Germany, but instead of turning back and going back to England, they kept going east. Landed in Russia. Seven and a half hours. Then they went and bombed oil refineries in Romania on the way to Italy. Landed in Italy. Then they went back to England bombing U-boat pens in France. One of our mechanics bails out of a B-17, spends a month fighting with guerrillas. Total mission, 6,000 miles, 10 countries, 29 hours of flying, 10 enemy planes destroyed, seven planes lost. This is strategy, this isn't tactics, this is strategic. Showing the Germans, showing the Russians what we're capable of doing. Kid Hofer, the last of the screwball aces. Kid is flying a spare Mustang on this mission. On the way home, he's deciding he's not having enough fun. He goes and strafes a Hungarian-German airfield. He gets shot down, he gets killed. The personnel back at Debden knew the second Hofer died because Duke started howling right at that moment. For decades, people thought that the greatest pilot in the fourth fighter wing had to be killed by the greatest pilot for the Third Reich. So for 50 years, people thought he got shot down by Eric Hartman. But he wasn't. He was shot down by ground fire. Winds up being tied with Goodson, 29 kills, as the highest scoring ace for the fourth fighter group. Just to show you what we were up against, German ME-163 
rocket plane. They would park these at the factories because when they lit the engine, they would go straight up, shoot down as many bombers as they can until they run out of fuel, and then they would glide back to Earth. Here's another view. Showed that because our guys shot these down. We're flying props, we're shooting down jet planes and rocket planes. November 1944, so many of the great pilots are being shot down, Blakesley's grounded because they don't want him to fall into the German hands. Comes back from a particularly long and tough mission. He's the last man back in. Blakesley is so exhausted, he doesn't put his landing gear down. So he barrels in without landing gear. Well, Blakesley's a man of honor, so because he pranked his kite, he sent himself home. Considered by many the greatest air combat leader of all time, he did fly more combat hours in World War II than any pilot, any American pilot anywhere in the world, Europe and the Pacific. The only American to die on Christmas Day Captain Don Emerson. I met his niece who wrote a book about him. Just wanted to show him. This was his, uh, this is a replica. This is a plane that's flying air shows today because his first name was Donald. He had Donald Duck on his plane. This was his victories. That's his name. January 1945. Lieutenant Van Chandler joins the 4th Fighter Wing. Relatively short period of time, shoots down his fifth plane. Well, no big deal. There's so many aces in the 4th Fighter Group, you can't walk to the chow hall without tripping over half a dozen of them. So he doesn't think anything of it. Decades later, he's a colonel in the Air Force. He's writing the American Fighter Aces Journal while he's eating breakfast. His wife's in the other room, and he goes, oh, that's cool. Hey, honey, I was the youngest American ace of World War II. He was 19 when he became an ace. How cool is that? His wife donated all of his medals and, and ribbons to the 4th Fighter Wing, and they're currently on display. Andy Lacey, had to mention him because he was a friend of mine. Andy became a, uh, a German POW. They were moving them in March of 1945, when they were strafed by P-51s, the guy next to Lacey was killed. And then they're marching in April. Their column is bombed by P-47s. Our own planes are bombing our own POWs. Well, when our guys realized what was happening, they put P-51 Mustangs flying cover over the POWs until the war ended, so that nobody was going to do that again. So it was like angels in the sky guarding American POWs from American planes. 16 April 1945, key day in the history of the 8th Air Force and the 4th Fighter Wing. Let's take out the Luftwaffe, what's left of it. 752 German aircraft destroyed. Before this day, the 56th Fighter Group is leading the 4th in number of kills. 334 attacks Gablingen, 335 and 6 hit other bases near Prague, 334 alone destroys 44 German planes. We lose 8 Mustangs that day. By the end of the day, we had destroyed 105 German planes to finish the war with 1,016 German planes destroyed. 16 April 2012, the week before, the wing commander says, hey, Doc, I'm going to see how many strike eagles we can put in the air at one time. I said, when, when are you going to do it? And he says, 16 April, does that mean anything? Heck yeah, that's Mustang mayhem. So we had strike eagle mayhem instead, put 70 strike eagles in the air. Very cool. That's what it looked like. Mustangs just taking out what was left 
of the German Luftwaffe. 1,016 destroyed. No group or wing has ever destroyed that many. No group or wing will ever destroy that many. Another very significant fourth but first. End of the war. Our guys go home in style. Our guys go home on the Queen Mary. How did the 8th Air Force and the 4th Fighter Group des destroy the Luftwaffe? We fought a, a strategic war, built heavy long-range bombers and long-range fighters to hit the enemy homeland. We destroyed the enemy's ability to wage war, bombing factories and airfields, taking out fuel supplies. Luftwaffe didn't even have enough fuel to train their new pilots, so they were putting pilots in the air who were sitting ducks. We achieved air superiority and then prevented the Germans from reinforcing their armies. When we assaulted D-Day, we could move men and equipment across the channel more easily than the Germans could move men and equipment across France because we had achieved air superiority. Eagle Squadrons, the fourth fighter, will, fourth fighter group, built the foundation of the fourth fighter wing. This is our mission today. Dominant strike eagle power, anytime, anywhere. Where'd that come from? World War II. Dominant Spitfire, P-47 and P-51 power, from Debden to Berlin, all the way to Russia. Today, be the combat wing of choice. Follow us. World War II, become the combat group of choice. Lead the way. World War II, 1,000 B-17s and hundreds of fighters would be required to take out a German factory. Today, one Strike Eagle can do the job. We'll send two just so they have a wingman. That's the power that the fourth fighter wing can wield. But the attitude and the spirit and the heritage was born in World War II. Fourth but first, then, now, and always. Any questions? Sir. Were those rockets that the Germans were sending out manned rockets? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. In fact, the emblem that they used was an old German grenadier flying through the air holding on to a cannonball, because that's what it was like. They lost more men to, mal to malfunction from the rocket planes blowing up than they lost to us shooting them down. Sir. Your duration was 15 minutes to launch Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, and they would go straight up, so they would be at altitude with the B-17s in seconds. Absolutely amazing. And, and think about it. When you look at the Luftwaffe and how good they were, how good their pilots were, how extraordinary their aircraft were, we shot them out of the sky. They were something, but we were better. Anybody else? Thank you so much for coming. Like I said, this was a departure from our normal uh, lecture about a single battle, but nothing I like more than talking about the greatest fighter wing in the history of the universe. I, I hope those of you who are here from the fourth I hope you have a greater understanding and appreciation for who we are and where we came from. And everyone else, when you, when you interact with our airmen, I hope you have a, a greater appreciation for how extraordinary they are and the history that they represent. That's, that's another thing. When I brief our airmen, I have briefed or I've been with our World War II airmen, our Korean War airmen, our Vietnam War, I am just as proud to be in a room full of our guys and gals from today as anyone who has ever served. When you think of how extraordinary our young men and women are who serve today, and they are, Winston Churchill called the pilots who won the Battle of Britain, the, the few, never has so much been owed by so many to so few. Well, less than 1% of Americans are in uniform today. So each and every soldier, airman, marine, sailor, 
they are the few. And we should all be indebted to them for their sacrifice and their dedication. Thank you so much.